Okay, I'm going to go to the first one, the first speaker, Dr. Paul Taylor. So he's a researcher at Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History, curator of Asian, European, and Middle Eastern ethnology, and head of that museum's Asian cultural history program. Author and also editor of numerous books and articles on the ethnography, linguistics, anthropology, and material culture of Asia. And Dr. Paul today will present the documentary experience of first expedition to the wilderness in, inside Indonesia. It was pioneer of cultural anthropology for any expedition of its kind, initiated by Smithsonian and worked with Netherlands is in this. How the storyline constructed from various cultural materials. Now, Dr. Paul, the time is yours. Hello, my thank you very much, Paul Michael Taylor, and I'm curator for Asia, Europe, and the Middle East at the Anthropology Department of the Smithsonian Institution and head of our Asian Cultural History Program. And as part of our series of lectures for this important conference celebrating the anniversary of uh, Indonesia's Museum Association, we're talking about examples of exhibitions and I wish I could take you on a tour of our exhibition. We don't currently have an exhibition up about Indonesia. And in fact, our museum is still largely closed because of the pandemic. And so we only have timed ticketed entries for some of the halls. And consequently, I'm going to take you on a tour of a virtual show instead, which you can visit yourself anytime on the web about an important historical expedition that took place to Papua in 1926. It was organized and planned by an American named Matthew Sterling. And he, he was associated with the Smithsonian. And he gathered up his own group of funders and people accompanying him. He didn't have a Smithsonian staff position, but the Smithsonian helped in many ways and was the beneficiary of the collections and the archives and the photographs that resulted. But it was a big complex New Guinea expedition and the Dutch East Indies government was very concerned about having an American expedition and insisted that it should be a joint expedition. It was the first expedition to use an airplane to, to explore New Guinea. So these are not contemporary goals in anthropology, but this was the source of an important expedition and an important uh, scholarly expedition and scientific uh, research that took place both on the Dutch and American side. And I feel that this publication which resulted, which we launched in 2006, an anniversary obviously of the expedition, uh, is a good example of how we can take a multiplicity of different sources and assemble them into a research publication that has a multimedia format. You can find this expedition on the website of the Smithsonian Institution Libraries. You can search for it at the sil.si.edu or the si.edu site, and I'll show the uh, link later. And I think you will maybe find this case inspiring for expeditions, archaeological discoveries, and so on, which often have a huge number of, huge amount of data to them. And, and how do you organize so much data? But the interpretive essays include a kind of general introduction that I wrote to the overall project and why it's important to revisit historical expeditions and historical records like this, even though their fundamental assumptions about the differences among people, about uh, the nature of uh, societies that they were visiting and so on are quite different from the ones we hold today, but they are historically very important. An important basis is his diary and other diaries. So we have also completely transcribed the, ex the expedition diary of uh, Hamer, the other American traveler on this expedition. Then we have graphic material such as his old maps. Of course, we have photographs. We have a large number of photographs. And here I will say is one of the greatest contributions 
of this particular project is sorting out those photographs. Uh, I will mention that Sterling himself, after completing this expedition, after turning over all this data to the Smithsonian, went on to become the so-called father of Olmec archaeology, uh, focusing on the Olmec people of the uh, historic uh, archaeological con uh, area of, of, of Mexico and Central America. But in anthropology, in the, in the 19th century, uh, collections of material culture from around the world were very, very important, primarily because the main theoretical or conceptual foundation of the science of mankind, the anthropology, was based on the, the concept of evolution and soci evolution of societies. So um, beginning with around 1900, Franz Boas, particularly in the United States and others, really argued against this idea that you could use the advanced level of material culture to consider that as sort of proxy for the advanced, the degree of advancement of a society. Now, after this time, people started discovering new interpretations of how material culture could be used, which is where we are now. So the growth in interest in ethnographic or cultural material from throughout the world has tremendously increased. All of these things are of historic interest, but people have not really uh, uh, explored the uh, any method, have rediscovered any method to make some of these kinds of data uh, useful in given that the theoretical constructions for which they were gathered are quite different today. Then there were large numbers of other Indonesian peoples. Uh, a very large Dayak population, Anji Pui is shown here as one example, um, but these were the people who were brought to New Guinea in order to row the long canoes, make the canoes, row the canoes, build the uh, houses and so on. So we had, a, you know, a, a whole kind of uh, group of, uh, 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 a village level group of people from different parts of Indonesia brought together and dropped into a Papuan setting in which you had Papuans also interacting. It was a very, very interesting phenomenon in the 1920s. Some of the 400 members of the expedition are here shown assembled at Albatross camp. Ambonese soldiers, Dayaks, and the scientific members and military members of the expedition. Hedberg, Sterling, Van Leeuwen, Captain Posthumus, Lieutenant Jordans, Hans Hoyt, the pilot, Prince Hamer, the mechanic. Number of the uh, Sibiri Papuans occasionally visited camp. So moving on, then we step back to look at the sterling so-called New Guinea expedition fostered by the Smithsonian Institution. Um, here's the example I mentioned of Papuans tasting fuel oil, which was intended for use in advertising later. And uh, images like this, where tribal people are enjoying the uh, aeronautical digest, uh, Des, you know, we can say probably designed as advertisements in that same magazine. So the net result, though, is that we have a very large number of photographs, a very large amount of daily writing uh, by all the people on the expedition. And that's what forms the expedition source materials that you see. As for browsing photos and films, um, here, uh, we see uh, a couple of things uh, here in this example. As you go through or, or browse or read from beginning to end any of the, um, the uh, diary entries. Okay, so um, source material we've covered and uh, uh, getting back to the different types that I showed you earlier. I think we've covered all of these now. 
But what I do want to mention is that there are particular ways to um, uh, transcribe these. Maybe we don't have time to talk about those today, but ways to check your transcription and ways to check uh, the accuracy of what you're recording. So basically, our our records go back to uh, the original data that we have. So, so this is uh, how we conclude uh, the kind of overview of the site and the uh, web address, as I said, is www.sil.si.edu slash expeditions slash 1926. Thank you all for your attention. And I hope you have a chance to enjoy this uh, website sometime when you have time. All right. Thank you, Dr. Paul. And don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, and also the participants, if you have any questions for Dr. Paul, please type it in the chat box.